Uh, welcome everyone to this optical education lecture series uh, co-hosted by Geninia Research Campus uh, Optical Interesting Group and Australian Biomedical Group. Uh, we want to take this series as a platform to introduce how state-of-art optical image technologies can be used in biology, medical and clinic researches. As you know, uh, each lecture will include the presentation and the Q&A section. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Uh, Boaz uh, Moha from Geninia Research Campus. Boaz did his master and a PhD in the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, working on single cell electrophysiology in the Visky system of mice and rats. Then he moved to Geninia for his postdoc research with Carl Soboda and Nelson Spuston since 2017. His research focuses on how neurons process information in the brain during behavior, which I believe is of broad interest. So today he will share uh, us with uh, his research. So with that, Bohas, so yeah, please take Thank over. You. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll share um, not super recent results, but some recent results on dendritic clustering of calcium signals in behaving animals. And um, the structure of the talk today is that I'm going to give you some background on the biology and the significance of why I'm interested in dendritic computation. Um, but also I'll talk about how do we measure these things, the inputs and outputs of neurons, uh, during which I'll talk about some of the caveats of these types of measurements and a bit more broadly about how these caveats might apply to other calcium system uh, measurements in systems neuroscience, um, but not all is bad. And so at the end, I'll tell you what we could do with these signals and how we found clustering of inputs during behavior. And so the brain to me is really a fascinating organ ever since the first descriptions of the architecture of the brain by Ramon y Cajal in the 1930s, it was clear that um, there's a lot of very interesting cell types in the brain that have very complex morphology. And even just by looking at the morphology of these special cells, it was clear to him that there is directionality in the flow of information in the brain. And so for example, if this cell A wants to communicate with cell B, he already knew that the path in which it would take is that, that cell A would send this thin process that we call the axon, and it would touch a protrusion on cell B in its dendritic tree, which is this thicker thing, and that's the way that A and B would communicate. And so now we have much more advanced ways of looking at these cells. Uh, one example is the mouse life project here in Genelia that can trace these axons throughout the brain of an entire mouse and as you can see here are labeled a few cells in the cortex and they can follow their projections and know who, where are these axons sent. And you can see that this is crossing millimeters and each one of these axons can have thousands of targets that it's communicating with. And that's true not only for the axon part, which is the output of the cell, but also for the dendritic part, which is the inputs of these cells. And so here, is one cell imaged in very high resolution with electron microscopy. And because it was imaged at such high resolution, it enabled tracing of all of the inputs, all of the protrusions, the spines at which um, inputs are coming in. And here are labeled thousands of excitatory and inhibitory inputs uh, that are connected to these, uh, this cell. And the integration of these inputs, meaning that if enough excitatory synapses are activated in time scales of milliseconds, the neuron will spike and convey that information, whatever that is, to the axon, which again could connect to thousands of other inputs. And so that's one scale of you know, systems neuroscience. And on the completely other side of the spatial and temporal scales, what we're interested in is how these neurons integrate their inputs, specifically when the network they're in is engaged in controlling the behavior of the entire animal. 
And that happens at the timescales of seconds to weeks. And so uh, in this Lubolo lab, we've accumulated a lot of knowledge about a simple tactile discrimination task in which um, a pole is presented to a mouse and it needs to use its whiskers to report the position of that pole. And so if the pole is in the posterior position, the animal needs to lick to the right to get a water reward. And if the pole is in the interior position, the animal needs to lick left. And here's a movie of a mouse performing this uh, behavior. You can see the pole moving up and down. The animal actually waits before it reports a decision. It's trained to have a delay between the time where a sensory input comes in and the motor action is performed. And you can see that um, after a few weeks of training, they get really good at this task. And so through multiple lines of evidence, we found um, that information flows through these whiskers to the primary sensory cortex where tactile sensation is processed, but then it moves to this anterior um, cortical region that we call anterior lateral motor cortex. And this is where we think the planning and movement <clears throat> of this uh, task is performed. In this case, directed licking. And uh, we know that this region has a critical role in this behavior from multiple lines of evidence. Uh, one of the experiments that I really like is called photo inhibition. And this experiment in a specific subset of trials, a uh, laser was pointed at different parts of the cortex randomly. And the um, laser basically inhibited the cortex, a small cortical region. And that, that's a way of uh, having an unbiased approach to figuring out where in the cortex are is the information carried by this task that's relevant for behavior. And so we found that if we inhibit during the delay or the motor planning part of the task, this anterior lateral motor cortex shows up and has a detrimental effect on performance of the animals, while other regions don't. And so if we go and look at the activity of neurons in this area, using either electrophysiology or imaging, we would see that individual neurons are often very selective for an upcoming lick, either to the left or the upcoming lick to the right. And we would call that right preferring or left preferring neurons. And what was a bit surprising initially was that the proportion of these lick left and lick right neurons is roughly even. And the preference of nearby neurons is intermingled. So given that each neuron sits among its neighbors that have these kind of random selectivity, either right or left, uh, one of the main questions was how does this selectivity arise? And so if we assume that each neuron gets a random set of inputs from its neighbors, and those are balanced between right and left preferring neurons, and these inputs are just simply summed we would expect to have a non-selective cell. But one way of getting selectivity is if we receive bias input. So that means that most input of a right selective cell comes from right selective neurons through their axons. Um, there's another alternative hypothesis is that um, we have organization of input that causes clustering. And here we see a demonstration of clustering that forces this cell to have right selectivity. And so the number of right and left selective inputs is the same, but summation is now no longer simple. Because these inputs are clustered, they affect the output of the cell more. And, and so in order to test this hypothesis in frontal cortex in an animal engaged in a behavioral task, we're going to use uh, fast calcium imaging. And so why are we using calcium imaging? So the reason is that when an axon has a spike delivering information from its upstream neuron, it reaches the dendrite of our target cell, ALM. In some cases that can trigger a local influx of calcium. And so there's a correlation between how much uh, activity was in the presynaptic neuron and how much calcium is in the postsynaptic spine, which is the place in which this input is connected to. 
Uh, but there could be also other types of ways that calcium enters the cell. One of them is dendritic spikes. This is thought to be caused from concurrent activation of several inputs that are close by, causing calcium entry by voltage-gated calcium channels. A third way is representing the output of the cell. So after reaching a threshold by summing inputs, the spike uh, also back propagates through into the dendrites and spines, giving rise to a global calcium signal. And so in order to image and know where and what the signals are, we need to image large contiguous stretches of dendrite. But dendrites are these tree-like structures that are very sparse in 3D. So we needed a new microscope that would be enable us to follow them. And so in a minute, I'll walk you through the schematic of how the microscope works, but I just wanted to show you the beast um, and so this is how the microscope looks like. It took us a little over a year to design and build this microscope. Um, and uh, Dan Flickinger that gave a previous talk in the series on the mesoscope uh, designed this and you will see the similarities between things. And I'll highlight some of the differences. This was actually built before the mesoscope, built and designed before the mesoscope. And so the mesoscope is sort of a version 2.0 of this uh, type of uh, optical system. And another note about this microscope is, uh, although it took a year to design and build, it actually took another three years to uh, create the software pipeline to run, operate, and, and post-process the data. And, um, and so there's, there were a lot of challenges um, in that side as well, although I'll, I won't talk about many of them. And so I think the best thing about this microscope is that we don't ever have to do it again. <laughs> and um, that we learned a lot of lessons about how to do this type of imaging uh, that were, were actually applied to the mesoscope. And so how does this um, work? I'll go through the basic design. Uh, I'll be focusing on the actuators that control where we're imaging. We, we're imaging a spot, right? A, a diffraction emitted spot. And the first thing that we do is we use a resonant uh, mirror to give us lines. And then we use another Y mirror, just like a normal 2P microscope to scan those lines into a frame. But because we're interested in dendrites, that frame is gonna be very strong. So here's a Y galvo scanning a small region. That region for us is usually 24 microns by 12 microns. If this was a normal uh, imaging system, imaging somas, population calcium imaging, that would be about 600 to a millimeter. And so we're imaging these postage stamps. And now we need to move them throughout our field because our field of view is still five, 600 microns. And so to address this postage stamp throughout the full field, we added an additional uh, X axis uh, galvo. Um, so now we can move this postage stamp and scan another one. But of course, as you saw, dendrites don't move within, within our flat plane, so we need to also move quickly in Z. And here again, the same solution that was applied in the mesoscope, here actually after the scanning. So one difference is that in the mesoscope, uh, the first step is to do the remote focusing and then the scanning. And here there's scanning and then the remote focusing. Um, and one reason not to do this is because they're actually you can burn the mirror very easily if you focus down on a single spot. And in the mesoscope, this place um, is not actually uh, conjugated to the sample plate. So here we're imaging onto a mirror and that mirror is then conjugated to our sample plane. So moving this mirror moves the focus in the animal. And the advantage here, like in the mesoscope, that moving a large objective is heavy and slow, but moving a one gram mirror is very fast. And so this way we can address up to a millimeter in imaging depth. Of course, not completely aberration free, but pretty good. And so now that we have this uh, layout, how would we use this microscope to image a dendrite? Let's look at this cartoon neuron. Again, the X resonant and Y galvo would give us a small frame and then we'll move that frame 
with the XY galvos to another branch, and then use remote focusing to image down, and we'll follow these postage stamps and put them along dendrites of the same cell, often jumping to the cell body to look at global signals correlated with the output of the cell. And so what's very important to this type of trajectory planning is that we know in advance where these dendrites are in space and that they actually belong to the same cell. And so to do that, uh, we, you need to label a very small fraction of cells in the cortex so that you can see their dendrites clearly. So we identify the transgenic mouse line that has very sparse expression of pre and frontal cortex, and then crossed it with a GCAM 6F recorder line. So this gives us sparse and stable expression of GCAM 6F in layer two, three cells in the frontal cortex. And so now we can come in every day to a reconstruction of a neuron. Uh, we build software to select parts of the dendritic tree. So day by day, we can um, image more and more of the same cell or other cells. And here we can go up to 300 microns of dendrite with our goal of imaging at around uh, 14 Hertz at volume rate. One thing to remember about calcium um, and calcium dynamics is that it's really the surface area of your um, region of interest in regards to its volume. So a cell body has a very large volume and small surface area, but the dendrites have large surface area and a small volume. So the same amount of calcium would lead to a higher signal and faster dynamics. And so you have to image faster if you're imaging an axon or a dendrite than you're imaging a soma. And so again, a lot of time and effort has gone into the microscope. Um, and again, one of the biggest differences between this microscope and the mesoscope is the NA. So this is, the entire microscope is an NA of 1.05. And that was necessary in order to look at and resolve these spines that are less than a micron in some cases. But again, the software side of things actually took more effort uh, and I'll show you some examples of the registration, but I won't go into segmentation and time course extraction. If people are interested, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about it for, for hours and hours. Um, yep. So here's an example of how these calcium signals look. You need to remember that global signals, signals that would appear in the cell body that is here, and if all of these branches that were falling sparsely in 3D represent the output. And spine localized signals that we've uh, enlarged here are going to be representative of input. And so here's a local and then global event. Here's another global event. If you notice here, there's some crossing dendrites and axons from other cells that are important to disentangle from what you're doing. And again, global and local events. And this is during here, the response period is where uh, the animal is licking. And so uh, I, just to give you a sense of, of what the actual raw data looks, that data that you saw now was um, registered. This is how the raw data looks. This movie is um, four times the real time sped up. Uh, and without any processing besides projecting it to be uh, 2D. This is actually, again, following dendrites in 3D. Um, so the first thing you'll notice is that there's a lot of motion in this dendrite, especially when the animal is licking, you can have motion. And that motion is also very apparent because the structures that we care about are very small. So even these small motions take out our spines completely uh, um, out of their fixed position, right? And so if you just put a mask and look at the traces, you would get very bad representation of the activity that's going on. The other thing is that the motion is pretty quick. And so even at our volume rate of 14 Hertz, there's non-rigid uh, um, motions where different imaging fields are moving differently. And so that needed a lot of work to correct. Um, and we, I think, took a good year to develop um, 
algorithms to correct both for this into account for Z drift and Z motion. Um, but I won't, I won't go into the details here. Again, if you have questions, I'll, I'll be happy to, to share. Actually, some of the tricks have been, uh, a variance of the tricks have been incorporated in other software packages, um, specifically uh, Sweet2P. And so this is the same data registered. We're very proud. I'm, I'm extremely happy with how good this uh, registration pipeline ended up. And um, we wouldn't have been able to do this without the support of, of open science and open software. We heavily relied on uh, Spark, which is an open source project of, for distributed computing um, that was originally developed at Berkeley. And the second thing I want you to notice about this data, and as you've seen from this movie and the previous one, all of the calcium signals that I was talking about, the synaptic input, dendritic spikes, or somatic global signals, are all happening at the same time. And so our, our dendrite doesn't look like these nice images where you either have a synaptic input or you have a spike. Everything is happening at the same time. And so if you want to know how input is integrated, you first have to separate the input and the output. And one of the uh, major questions is how, how can you do that? And so what we said is, okay, let's start with the model where we know the ground truth and look at contributions of spines to the output. And so what we want, the biggest question that we can, um, the biggest unknown, is how these inputs and outputs correlate, right? If we know how inputs and outputs correlate, we can start figuring out how inputs may be uh, coactive or clusters. But first, we need to figure out what is the input. And so let's look at this simulated neuron. We have a soma. Its contribution is going to be in black. And I made up five spines. And the contribution of each spine are these green uh, Gaussian curves. And again, this is response as a function of time in the task, our, our sample delay and response, but this could be anything, right? The soma is tuned, it has contributions here, and there's a bunch of spines that have different response tunings. And so, if we will do a perfect subtraction of the global component of the spiking component from our mixture, then we'll know that the correlation of spine one is exactly one and spine five is zero. But even if we ignore the fact that there are dendritic um, uh, spikes or any in between things, it's very unlikely that we'll know exactly what the model is for subtracting the um, spikes, the backpropagating action potential, because these inputs and these outputs are actually combined at the voltage level. And then there's a nonlinear transformation from voltage to calcium. And then our calcium sensor has another nonlinear transformation from calcium to fluorescence. And so reversing this model, which has two layers and a lot of nonlinearities, is pretty um unlikely given the amount of data and snr that we have and and also the speed at which calcium is is uh responding to these events maybe not impossible but per basically not your first guess that we would have the perfect way of reversing this process and figuring out how much voltage each one contributed and therefore how much calcium therefore how much fluorescence we expect and so then we're left with two other situations in one situation we're under subtracting the effect of the soma from our spines. So we look at the spines, but the total response here in yellow is a combination of what was left from the soma that we didn't subtract and the contribution of individual spines. And so what this would do under subtracting of this signal, this mixed signal would increase the total correlations that we're seeing in the inputs. Another thing that people uh, could try and do is over subtract. One example of over subtraction is saying, let's ignore all the times in which the soma was active. And that's one way of, over, of, of subtracting, right? That might over subtract, and then you'll get 
negative correlations of a lot of your inputs with the SOM, which of course doesn't make sense because the most interesting part that we care about is those milliseconds, tens of milliseconds, hundreds of milliseconds in which inputs are combined to produce the output. And so we really came to the conclusion that it's very hard to use calcium imaging to figure out the input output correlations of spines and dendrites. And so the question is, is this only relevant to dendrites and spines? Well, what about other signals? Um, and what about population calcium imaging that doesn't have you know, back propagating action potentials and synaptic inputs? But actually there are equivalent signals to the same type of problem of mixtures even in population calcium imaging, and also in dendritic glutamate imaging. I won't talk about that example, but again, if, if you're interested, I can elaborate in the end. And so let's look at uh, population calcium imaging. Here, you also have concurrent signals. And as um, another speaker in the series said, and I, and I totally agree that everyone that's doing microscopy with light and looking at its sample should always look at a dense reconstruction of an EM volume of the same sample so he can understand what are the signals and where they're coming from. One of the uh, realizations, if you do that, is that at each point when you're pointing your microscopy system at a point in the brain, you're imaging always a combination of what you care about in population calcium imaging, which is the cell and its surrounding neuroplasm which is a combination of a lot of axons and dendrites that represent inputs and outputs of other cells. Uh, one of the movies that I really like to show is from the Microns Project, which actually took a 2P image section of the mouse brain and later did uh, uh, electron microscopy. And so they can superimpose those two volumes. And so here you can see, you know, normal 2P in green and EM in black and white. And you can see all of those tiny, tiny structures here are um, other axons and dendrites that could contribute to the signals that you're imaging when you're imaging your soma. And so you can think of a few scenarios. If we have, we're imaging a cell and that's the only cell that is currently firing, it's spiking, we get fluorescence and it has no correlation with other cells or inputs coming in, then we don't have to do anything. The value of the cell that pixel is, should remain exactly the same. But there could be local inhomogeneity of those local inputs with variable correlation of inputs to your soma. And so you would have to account for those in some way. And in the worst case scenario, everything is firing at once. And in that case, you wouldn't even know how to assign how much of that fluorescent signal is coming from your cell versus the background. And of course, each cell is different. Another thing that it really depends on is your labeling strategy. If you're imaging very densely or you're imaging, or you're labeling very densely, this could be worse. If you're labeling in a region where cells are packed, if you're injecting in one brain area that sends axon to another brain area, you can have very strong biases in your um, contamination in your neuropod. And so to show you, this is not just me talking, uh, you can, we can have some images. And this time, this is coming from the original GCAMP6 uh, paper where they've done simultaneous cell attach recording so they can record electrically from one cell and 2P image it. But the question here now is where is the neuropod? We care about signals from this cell and there's a bunch of other things. One common way of analyzing this data is taking a mask, averaging all the pixels that are here, taking a mask, looking at all the pictures that are outside and multiplying by a factor and, and, and subtract it out. That's called neuropil subtraction, which again, I'm hoping it's already reminiscent for you guys about back AP subtraction. There's no way that we know the exact model, right, of how all these axons and dendrites affect my signals. And so how would I know to subtract them correctly? And so here's a movie of some activity and you can see how complicated neuropil signals could be. 
both in time and in space. And so another thing to remember is that rise in calcium, again, like I said, is proportional to the volume. As we get better and better calcium indicators, this get worse because we can detect smaller and smaller things. And axons and dendrites could be brighter than somas because they're so small. And so um, one of the studies that I like to share um, in regards to that is uh, people that try to validate how we can do automatic source extraction to look at these calcium signals uh, in, in animals. And in this study, they, there's, they have some automated way, it doesn't really matter, uh, to extract a mask. Here's this mask. Um, and using this mask, they can look at transients. Transients are places at which the cell produced an output, a bunch of spikes. And they literally went event by event and manually curated what seems to be true transients, meaning that it looked like the average of the signal and false transients, meaning contamination from other cells. And um, the effect on the biology here is that these were recorded in a place in the brain where cells fire in response to a specific place in the environment. And they found that 109 cells were labeled as significant place cells, which were actually due to contamination. And if you look on the right here, the position in the arena of contaminated versus decontaminated cells is different. So things that are not on the diagonal here means that we came to the wrong conclusion about where these cells are. And this is true not just for one data set. They looked at four. Um, so it's a really nice effort that shows that in these types of data, uh, you can probably, using automated methods, maybe you, you need to pay attention to what could be happening. Here. And so the conclusion from this part is, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? Um, why are there so many calcium imaging papers then? Is no one realizing this? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, people are pretty smart. And so uh, the main point here is that we need to understand what is the question that we want to address using these methods? What is the analysis that you have to do in order to reach a conclusion about that question? And would any of these confounds change the conclusions of your study, right? So some questions are really good for calcium imaging. Some questions are pretty bad. And let me give you a, a short example. Um, in this example, I wanna figure out what is the tuning width of some cell. And so I'm giving, in this example, I'm showing different stimuli, could be gratings. I'm looking at the visual system. I'm doing different gratings and I have a cell and this is its firing response. But because I have calcium imaging and the transformation from spikes to calcium is not linear, I might be in the uh, nonlinear regime here where spikes are super linearly summed with calcium. And so if I look at the fluorescence response from the same cell, I would say that the tuning width is narrower than it really is because I'm missing here and I'm over amplifying here. And so if I'm measuring tuning width with calcium, I might get the wrong answer. In another cell where I have higher background number of spikes, I might be in different regime for calcium indicators in the saturating regime. And that could be, for example, in inhibitory cells where the firing rate is higher or deeper cells in the cortex, there are five cells. Again, five, average firing rates are higher. God forbid you're recording in monkeys. Um, and so here calcium has a different property where it could be saturating. And so in the response, if we measure the tuning width of our cell from our fluorescence, we would come to the wrong conclusion that it's narrow, it's wider than it really is. Because again, we don't have the dynamic range to go any higher. And so just to show you again from the same data set of how spikes convert to fluorescence and the nonlinearity, this is the movie that you saw from the GCAM6 paper. Now I'm showing you a trace of the fluorescence over 15 seconds roughly. And all of these stars are spiking events. 
And the only difference between them is that all of these were single spike events and these were two spikes. And you can see that the nonlinearity of the fluorescent response is really big in this example. I, I cherry picked this, but it exists, right? It's not the average, but it's definitely in, the, in this range. So what is a good question that we can ask about this data? A good question is where is the tuning peak, right? What is the preferred direction? What is the preferred stimulus? In this case, using spikes or fluorescence, you would always get the right answer. Regardless of where you are in the nonlinearity, you would say that this cell responds best to this grading direction. And so going back to uh, calcium imaging and dendrites, we saw that figuring out the input-output correlations is not um, probably possible with current methods. But what we were able to simulate and then extract is the distance-dependent uh, pairwise correlations. And so in the same set of dendrite and spines here, we can ask what is the correlation of all these pairs and how does that correlation decay with distance? And that relates to clustering. If we have clustering, then close by spines would have more similar tuning. And what we could show with simulations, and this is just a toy example in the paper, we, we dive deeply more into the details, is that the spatial scale of those correlation remains the same even though you under or over subtract. And so not to 100%, but this is kind of a question that is more robust to the types of analyses that you have to do in order to extract these signals. And so the data that we've acquired here is about nine millimeters of dendrite, uh, thousands of spines, over thousands of behavioral trials and 10 animals. And um, these are the totals that we have. And again, I wanna show you that the first thing that we noticed about our data is that most of the time, if there's activity in the dendrites, there's also activity in the cell body. That means that a lot of the time, the signals that we care about are global and that there's very little independent dendritic activity. So that middle spatial scale of more than one spine, but less than everything was really rare to see as an independent event. And so this is how it looks. If you notice the, the decay constant of the soma is much larger than the branches, but still every time there's an event in the soma, there's an event in the branches and other way around. But as, as we looked uh, further from the soma, we started seeing more variability. In this example, in this event, spiking event, we see that branch one has a higher calcium signal that decays a bit slower. But a few seconds later, we can see another global event, but this time branch two has a higher calcium signal than branch one. And so although things are kind of global, there's still variability to explain. And so again, I wanna remind you about the task that we're doing. There's a sample period where the pole is presented to the animal. Then it has to wait for two seconds in this case before a cue comes in, and then the animal needs to lick in the correct response. Again, the same movie. And what we did is we divided these into one second intervals and averaged the response of our dendrites and spines. So we can look at different temporal epochs, and we could look at different trial types, lick right and lick left trials. And this is one example of trial average activity from one session, the top row is lick right condition, the bottom row is lick left, and you can see that things look pretty similar across, there's, there's a high activity here in the delay, but it is represented in more than one region as probably a global signal. And so after subtracting the back AP, we can see more variability, and we start seeing, for example, here, masks that look like spines and dendrites that in this example respond more to lick left than lick right trials. And so again, we want to measure clustering. And so we want to look at the distance dependence of this signal. 
And so um, we uh, define distance as the path length between two spines or dendritic segments. And path length means that if you have a spine here on the dendrite and a spine here, their distance is not this, but because of the way the dendrite is, you have to go through here. So this is the path length distance between these two spines, you have to follow the dendrite. And signal correlation is just the Pearson R between the trial averages. So for these two example spines, we concatenate the left and right trials. Each one of these is an epoch. This is the average response of spine A, the average response of spine B, and they're highly correlated. And the question is, how does that correlation behaves with the distance between the pairs? And so we saw that tuning similarity is high between nearby dendrites and spines. And this is the main result. You can see that uh, this is for uh, dendrites in layer two, three, and in layer five, and in spines in layer two, three, and in layer five, we have a spatial constant of between six and 20 microns in which there's a high correlation between their neighboring spines. And that is significantly um, different than a shuffle distribution. And also one of the uh, nicer controls that we can do with this type of imaging is these uh, spots here where you see that's marked with Euclidean. That means that these two spines um, we're actually close by in Euclidean distance. But in this population, we said, we want all pairs of spines that are close by physically, but are very far away if you look at path length through the dendrite. And so this could give us an estimate if there's errors in terms of um, motion or some kind of other imaging artifact, you would expect that to affect those spines that are imaged close by. But we see that these have very small uh, signal correlation which was very reassuring. Another interesting finding here was that uh, we can again look at very uh, close by pairs of, of spines and divide our data set into two. In one, these are close by spines that are on the same branch. And in the other, again, all close by spines, but they cross a branch point. And so when you divide your data to within and across branches, you see that the signal correlation decreases when you cross a branch point. So whatever mechanism that um, learning, developmental, or otherwise seems to notice or care about these dendritic branching points, which might um, limit the types of hypotheses that we would have of how these things were created. And so um, in conclusions uh, and some thoughts, uh, I've shown you that inputs in ALM are clustered and that they care about dendritic branches, which might help us figure out the mechanisms with which these correlations and clustering is created. Uh, but throughout which I complained about calcium imaging. And I, I think that many of the signals that we record are usually complex mixtures. And so um, now at least when I, approach a new project, the, the main things that I, I care about is, oh, is there some existing data that I can look at? Is there something that I can already analyze without spending a year and a half or three years building a microscope? Um, can we model what we think would happen? Um, a lot of the times we come in with very um, strong opinions about what we think the, the processes that should happen. You can simulate those and then try your analysis before you acquired even a single byte of data. Um, of course, all these advice is looking back, right? <laughs> and so I'd like to finish uh, with acknowledging all the people that contributed to this project. Uh, this started initially with Aaron Curling, uh, Carl, and Naji. And then um, I said, Dan, as I said, Dan designed the optical system and um, uh, Jane and uh, Srini helped us a lot with the data analysis. And that's it. Oh, I'll be happy to take your questions.
Thank you, Boaz. Thank you very much for the fantastic next year. So I personally learned a lot from your talk, I believe. So the audience has the same feeling. Uh, we already have two questions. So uh, Yuriki, would you like uh, to speak up by yourself? Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for, for the nice presentation. I actually have two questions. The first question is maybe redundant. That, that was more about uh, whether you plan to also include adaptive optics in the system, because if you measure deep into tissue, you might be faced with aberrations. But I guess since you're not interested in like very teeny tiny resolution, so and, and only about the core structures, maybe that's not so severe. But I don't know if uh, there are any plans no, to modify the system. This is that that was the original uh, conception. That was the reason Najee was involved in the inception of the project. Uh, what Aaron found was that you can correct for like 80% of the problem with the type of imaging that we're doing by being very precise in how you position the animal. And so uh, it's a bit of going into the specifics, but we have three cover slips that contain our window that we press down on the brain that helps with motion uh, suppression. And so going through three pieces of glass, if you're not going precisely perpendicular, will have a lot of aberrations. And so uh, we have a way of mounting the mice on uh, a platform that could tip and tilt. And in every session, we actually image the interface between those pieces of glass and correct a tip and tilt. And so we're going perpendicularly through those pieces of glass and that corrects for most of the aberrations that you care about. Doing the AO uh, would probably help, but it was such a complicated system that we didn't want to complicate it even more. Yeah, but but thank you for explaining the, the part with the tip and tilt, because I know that that can mess up the PSF quite strongly, in particular, if you have water immersion or so, like you uh, quite quickly can go from a um, yeah. from an ellipsoid to like more like a banana shape point, a point spread function. But so maybe then the, the second question would be actually. And, and just said, this, and, yeah, and yeah. that's already implemented in the mesoscope and people that are interested in that. It's also in the Genelia website. Um, they can download the designs and build it. Yeah, that's actually good that you point this out. Like, uh, thank you very much. But so, so the second question would be: You said that for the interpretation of the signal, since there are so many dependencies, it's sometimes hard to come to a conclusion. I mean, what would you, when you right now screen the literature and read any kind of calcium imaging papers? Um, what would you recommend people uh, like how, how they should actually report about their data? Because I guess like based on your experience, uh, people might be maybe very bold in their interpretation. Ah, oh, that's clearly this and that. But but you actually know from, from your experience with those measurements that uh, there's a ton of things which can uh, disrupt actually, uh, or like, I don't know, hinder proper uh, proper interpretation. I mean, what would you recommend people how they should maybe phrase when they analyze such type of data? Well, again, my, my suggestions are kind of the same, but I can give a few more examples of things that are obvious offenders. Uh, for example, conjunctive tuning, right? A cell that is tuned for two things. That's very suspicious. How are you sure that this is one thing? If you want to make the case that something is co-tuned, you have to be very clear about where signals are coming from. If you care about peaks of things, then you're probably okay because the peak is the most robust. And so for binary things, we could be a bit more sure about what we're, what we're talking about. And for graded things, we need to start looking at the details. And one of the best types of designs that you can do is an internal comparison. For example, in hippocampus literature, there's things like remapping, right? You can't explain remapping with, with just uh, in a mixture of signals, things obviously changed. And so some things are more robust than others and it's, um, yeah. Sorry if I, I don't have a better no, no, answer. No, but it was like, it, it was actually uh, very insightful. Like kind of, it was showing me that how uh, complex actually uh, these type of imaging modes are. And I wasn't uh, like uh, so much aware of this before, but thank you very much. Yeah, by the way, spiking is not any better. At, at least when you're uh, just just to you know not bum up all the microscopists. 
but uh, you have the same issue with uh, spike sorting uh, in these high density probes where you have a lot of sources, electrical sources, and you're trying to figure out clusters of spike shapes in from all that noise. You can still have contamination. And if you want to say that there's conjunctive tuning, yeah, that's, it's, it's not easy. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Another audience, Tiananmen, if you are here, so you are free to raise the question by yourself. Um, hi, um, um, thanks for the talk. That's uh, great. Um, I have a question regarding the measurement uh, of the distance across the spines. Yeah. Um, from the image you labeled in the presentation, it doesn't seem that this distance is measured across 3D. Across what? Sorry. Across the whole volume. Like the, the yellow line, is this actually um, distance across the, the spines in, in the whole volume, or is it like from a projection of the 2D image? Oh, no, no. This was done in 3D. Yes. Okay. It's illustrated in 2D, but the measurement was done in 3D. Yeah. Yeah, that's clear. Thanks. Uh, so both. So, so I have two questions. So the first question is about the crosstalk and all the contamination. So the crosstalk of calcium signal, so in soma, so uh, from neuron peel, if I understand yeah. correctly. So what caused the crosstalk? Is it because the limited resolution, spatial resolution of optical microscope, or is it because like the interaction of the neurons of soma? So can you no, no, explain you're... more? Your first, your first was correct. It's because in the PSF, we have more than just a soma for some of the pixels and definitely for lower NA systems. And so if the PSF is uh, bigger in Z than a soma, right? A soma is a circle. So definitely in the edges, it's collecting information more than just your cell of interest and a lot of axons and dendrites. And those axons and dendrites could have correlations in them that would amplify that signal. So it's not just one axon turning on. If you have visual stimulus, then many thalamic neurons fire at once and many axons in the cortex would show up and those are not random axons. They go into specific locations, they have spatial structure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the clarify. Uh, my second question is, yeah, you, you already mentioned, so uh, you can talk for hours <laughs> about the motion correction. So yeah. I would like to ask, would you like to lay out like some tricks of registration that the audience can do by using open source software or commercial available software? Would you like? Yeah, so one thing that is incorporated into Suite2P is that after registration, you could look at the PCA of your movie. And what you would want to see is the first principal component being activity. If you have drift or you have Z motion or you have residual motion, one of your PCs is gonna represent that motion and not activity. We actually use those PCs to um, do uh, iterative registration. And so in our case, there's no way of escaping Z motion and Z motion is, is, is uh, important because the way that you uh, calculate delta F over F is knowing your baseline. And when the dendrite goes out of focus, the baseline changes. And so we had to not just find where places are different in Z, which we've done sort of using like a PCA method, we can look at uh, PCs that represent different Z positions, we ordered them. And then when we extracted the signals, we actually took different baselines for different time points, considering that we think we know which Z positions they belong. And so it gets complicated really quickly. <laughs> another, uh, another thing is uh, iterative registration. You can make an initial guess have that guess be a prior to your um, next best guess. You can average a bunch of frames randomly, or you can average frames that look pretty close together. That gives you an initial target. 
Now, when you register to that target, you can have some priors. Sweet2P also kind of uses that when it gives you a threshold to say, if it moves 20 pixels in one frame, don't move it back. It's probably wrong. So in our code as well, we have a prior about how fast things can move from one frame to the other. And so that helps us um, get rid of things like if you have two dendrites, one is active in one frame and one is active in the other, you would just jump it over. But because it's such a big jump, we know how to reject it because the previous uh, plane didn't move by anything. So this plane can't move as well. Cool. Do, do you have any reference that can uh, the audience can reference to? So like your eLife paper? Would yeah, in the eLife paper, there's a GitHub repo um, with the code in it. Most of the register, I think the registration code is there. There's also a supplemental figure that walks through the, the registration uh, procedure and you should just email me and we can chat. Cool. So then we will put the, the reference link on the cover slides. Then when people watch this audience, watch this YouTube video, then <laughs> they can find the reference. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. I see someone with their hands up. Yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, hey. Boaz. Craig Stewart here from Canberra. Hey, um, excellent talk, thank you very much. Uh, a couple of questions. Yep. Um, I'm interested in your functional interpretation of the clustering. So do you think that what you're seeing there is just a number of spines which are being simultaneously activated? Or do you think what you're seeing is generation of a local dendritic spike? So we tried really hard to figure out what we can say about those intermediate spatial scales and dendritic spikes. It is obviously of huge interest to us. And we've done many analyses. And again, when we go back to simulations and try to figure out how robust our interpretation is, it, it wasn't as bad as trying to figure out input output correlations, but it wasn't great. So we can simulate hotspots and we can simulate hotspots at different spatial scales and then see if we can detect them with their current methods and back AP subtraction things. Mm -hmm. And things work pretty well until you, and, and, until you assume that there's more than one spatial scale. If there's more than one spatial scale, then you're in trouble. And so we didn't feel comfortable you know, showing that type of analysis because we can't make that assumption. Um, we still don't, you know, I think that this is local cooperativity of NMDA receptors and, and probably also voltage gated calcium channels. But, you know, as it, it could be the case that in this type of preparation, when the animals engage and in this pain region, these dendrites, it's just the type of bombardment of inputs is in a puts the us in a regime where it's hard to disentangle because others have reported on these isolated dendritic events. We, we almost never see them. Right. Um, and just another quick question. I wasn't quite clear about the importance of when uh, inputs are onto a different dendritic branch. How, how did, um, did that influence these correlations? Was it the case that you more often saw correlations when the inputs were on the same branch as opposed to a different branch or vice versa? Or just was, Yeah, was so reasoning? what we did was um, we tried to figure out if the branch point is important. Yeah. So we only looked at sp spine pairs that are within 10 microns of each other. And then we divided it up to either spine pairs within the same branch or cross branches. Yeah, Spines yeah. across branches have less correlations. And so we think that this clustering of around 10 microns spatial scale cares about branch points. That right. can be, that, that kind of, you know, advocates for a postsynaptic mechanism because you wouldn't mm. think that axons passing by this dendrite and random would care about branch points. So, you know, it could be developmentally, it could be learning, it could be, you know, number of processes. 
that probably care about the postsynaptic voltage because I think that's one of the things that changes in the branch point. That's our guess. We have no um, way of knowing that. And that's actually why I'm not doing any calcium imaging anymore. We're, we're you know, in order to be kind of quantitative and, and it is the next step, right? We wanna figure out the mechanisms that is causing that clustering. One of the things that we're missing is the identity of proteins at these places. And so, yeah, that's okay. what I'm seeing on next. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure. Anyone? Any more questions? So right. I've got a quick question, I guess. This is more from the instrumentation perspective. Um, yep. There's new instruments coming up, the Diesel2P and a range of sort of dual head um, scopes and, um, and also with adaptive optics attached to those. Um, do you think from those new developmental sort of large massoscope imaging, would that help, you know, going back to the discussion of resolving a better PSF or deep tissue, or in this case, deep brain imaging. Do you think there's a, developing the optics would help? No. Nope. Yeah. Good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not for input-output correlations in spines. The mm. optics here wouldn't, weren't uh, limiting. We, were, we had great PSFs. Our Z resolution was less than two microns at some point in our lives aligning that microscope was hell, but um, it was possible at least once. So I don't think the optics is the issue here. The indicators are right. how fast calcium is responding to these things. If we had an amazing voltage indicator, that's great. But people kind of forget that the reason we're doing calcium is because it's a volume filler, mm -hmm. right? And again, the volume of a neuron is way, way bigger than its surface area. And so going to voltage just immediately gives you a huge disadvantage, especially for somatic imaging, but also for dendritic imaging. And um, I think that the best direction is actually Casper, um, Casper's microscope, the SLAP yes. version two, um, because with, uh, I, I didn't talk about glutamate imaging, but there you have kind of the same two types of signals. One is the synaptic input, and the other is glutamate spillover. If the entire tissue is releasing glutamate, you have spillover and these sensors are sensitive enough to detect those. And so you would see dendrites lighting up in glutamate, which of course is not the biology, right? The, the AMPA receptors don't care about spillover glutamate as much as the sensor. So, uh, so maybe the but way there, but so, there so. is a trick. The trick there is that spillover is slow and synaptic transmission is fast. So if you can go at two kilohertz, you can distinguish them. Doesn't That's matter how fast you go with calcium, you're not going to be able to distinguish things. So, so I guess the question next would be really the dynamic range of the imaging system is critical rather than you know, PSF specific, right? So the, you, again, for spines, you have to have, I think, glutamate, speed, and PSF. Right. Okay. Which I see possible with, with Casper's scope. I but see. that is for the very specific input output, right? You don't have to have that microscope for population imaging. What you need for population imaging is be careful about what you, you know, what you claim about your data um, when, when you're doing something that you know is a, the, the underlying data is a mixture. Thanks. Cool. So I want to uh, follow up uh, one question along this line. So, um, so we know so how neurons process the information in the brain during the behavior. I think it's the most interesting and challenging question in neuroscience. So I, I know it's, it's, it's very difficult, right? So the, would you like to provide some insight? So if we, or yeah, if people wants to solve this issue, what would be the, uh, the direction or what would be the requirement? So like uh, instrumentation, uh, software processing, label indication, yeah. Yeah. So I'm pretty biased with my answer because I'm doing something, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that there's two things that we're missing at this point. Um, one is an unbiased measurement of where changes are happening 
Usually you don't just look at the brain, you wanna see a change. Just looking at the brain operating without doing any manipulation is really hard to understand. And so when you are doing a manipulation, whether is it even development, a disease model, learning, whatever it is, something changes in the brain. And it's very hard for us to have an unbiased um, estimation of where things are changing. Um, I'm trying to address that with, with some pulse chase experiments where you tag a synaptic protein and look at how much it's turning over. And that's something that you can do post hoc and look at the entire brain. The other thing that you're missing is knowing the players. Everyone has his favorite protein and everyone's blocking NMDA receptors and saying that they found an effect. But these are really complicated nonlinear systems and any single manipulation that you do has a cascades of effects. And so when, you, when we saw this clustering in these dendrites, the next obvious question is what is the mechanism? But we don't have good manipulations uh, to target to specific subcellular compartments. And part of this is that we don't know the players. And so um, in collaboration with Paul Tilburg, I'm trying to develop expansion microscopy to enable looking at multiple proteins, um, then tens and, and 20s of proteins in the dendritic tree to try and figure out the synapses that are changing, what is changing. And then if we can disrupt that specific protein that's special for the changing synapses, do we prevent learning? This is really far off, but um, and, and most of it is not optical, sorry, but um, that's, that's at least my direction. I'll, I'll be happy to hear other opinions. That's, that's really cool. So when you're talking about um, the expansion microscope, or if I heard correctly, so would, would, would you have any, like, um, any insight of like, time-lapse imaging? No, oh. expansion microscopy. <laughs> It's a one shot thing after you fix your tissue. Right, right. Yeah, so it's just a way of getting super resolution imaging of multiple proteins in thick tissue. And so hopefully to compare between, um, let's say a cell that has not been manipulated and a cell that has been manipulated. What are the molecular changes that are happening along the dendritic tree? That's a question that's very hard to answer currently. Mm -hmm. Right, it sounds like a long way to go. <laughs> so uh, just, just a sort of a side on question, because um, I guess the, the latest sort of imaging for spatial transcriptome, um, those process, well, it's gene expression, and would that in itself, you know, lend um, more information to, to sort of um, specific disorder, and that, would that be the direction to some extent? We're definitely very inspired by that. Uh, to start this project in, with expansion microscopy, but um, we think that the, act, the actuators are eventually proteins right. and not mRNAs. You can learn a lot by mRNAs and maybe there's correlates of learning in, in the mRNA level, but that's kind of at least two stages removed from uh, what we're seeing here today, right? There's voltage and the voltage changes, it changes something about proteins, probably in those proteins then later on maybe change something about transcription. So um, we're very inspired by how well that has worked and we're trying to make that work for proteins. Not exactly similarly because um, mRNAs, are very easy to get targets for very different mRNAs because the principle is the same. Whereas uh, for proteins, you rely on antibodies which have varying quality. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so very nice. Last call for questions. If anyone has any question, so last chance. <laughs> oh, okay, so then thanks Biles again for the excellent talk. Thanks everyone for joining. So hope to see everyone in our next, next short talk. <laughs>